This is Chuck Sachs for Indie Opera Podcast, and I'll be talking with composer Julian Wachner and librettist Cerise Lim Jacobs about the New York premiere of their opera, Rev 23, as part of Prototype 2020, being given three performances on January 17th and 18th at the Gerald W. Lynch Theater at John Jay College. Hello, Julian and Cerise. How are you? Good. Hello. Hello there, Chuck. I'm very well, thank you. And unfortunately, Cerise is via FaceTime because... Well, she lives in Boston area, but that's we're really glad you're you're able to join us this way. I'm happy to. So, Julian told me that you met both through Vox when uh, City Opera was still doing Vox. Actually, it wasn't that. But when I said okay. all of us were meeting, oh, okay, met, it was the sort of Beth Morrison, oh, okay. Paul Cassini, David Little, and then that led to meeting Cerise. So oh. it's all kind of snowballed. Okay, so when did you first meet, and after that, how long did it take to start a collaboration? Well, it's interesting. Um, Beth Morrison and Cerise sort of reached out to me um, to see if I would have any interest in being the chosen composer. I mean, it was sort of a competition. I think a number of us uh, submitted our works um, to... Um, uh, White Snake Productions, you know, at that point, mm-hmm. and um, they sort of um, thought that my sort of eclectic style might match this libretto uh, mm-hmm. best. And gosh, that is that like five years ago now, Cerise? Oh my God, Julian! It premiered in twenty seventeen, so I think we spent about um, three to four years developing this. What? Do you think that sounds right? Yes, there's definitely two years of libretto production, and I think it was 2016 that I sort of furiously wrote um, a good deal of it, because then in the fall of 2016, we had our first workshop, Mm -hmm. and then 2017. Yeah, that would make sense. That would be the good timeline. So then, Cerise, was there a full draft of the libretto already created at that point, before you had a composer? Mm-hmm. And that draft undergoes significant changes because I do not um, write derivative um, libretti. In mm-hmm. other words, all my libretti are um, new stories that I make up because yes. I have so many stories. <laughs> I want to tell. Well, I don't need to adapt. Other that, and that that's wonderful and. That's getting a little rare in the world of music theater and even some of opera. Absolutely. Um, so what was Absolutely. your impetus for writing this story at, and writing it for an opera? Well, yeah. So the re- reason I have to write a full draft is because it being a new story, it's really impossible for me in a summary to tell mm-hmm. a composer what this story is about. Right. It's much, yeah, it's much easier to do a preliminary draft, show it to the composer, and then say, does it speak to you? Because, you know, sometimes it doesn't. I, I hear you. There has to be a good match. Um, but what drove you, what brought you on to write this story? Well, um, my husband Charles died, um, unfortunately. And uh, I was thinking about him um, one day and um, wondering where he was. I I do that often. And um, I thought to myself, I wonder if he's in that place up there. (laughs) (laughs) And then I thought, no, they would never let him in. Uh, so he'd probably be, be consigned to that other place down there. And that got me thinking about what mm-hmm. he could possibly be doing down there and who the denizens uh, were that lived down there. And mm-hmm. it slowly evolved. It evolved 
into, you know, heaven and hell and all the mythology that goes with it, from Greek mythology to, of course, uh, the book of Revelation, and um, that's how it happened. Well, I, I love also that it's a farce, because not too many people are actually writing operatic farces, or even trying. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Well, it's a very dark farce, and because it, it deals with, um, you know, extremely uh, important and fundamental issues about who we are and whether human beings can really realize the full potential living in a utopia. And in fact, can a utopia withstand human beings? <laughs> um, yeah, and, and, and I think it's very eclectic, and um, I, I, anybody who knows Julian um, and, and knows his personality, uh, he has this satirical wit, he has this dark side, he has this extremely um, eclectic ability to put many different and differing elements together, which is what this libretto is and what it requires if for a master composer. Right, so Julian, when you were fine, you were chosen and you went up to meet uh, or sat down to, with Cerise, how much has the, did the libretto change from that point? Um, it changed a lot. We um, we had a number of workshops. Uh, we had uh, a professional dramaturg who was involved. We had a couple directors who were involved. We had readings with um, um, actors. And it became clear that there were certain um, suppositions and assumptions that we had made as creators, like that everybody knows about Greek, Greek mythology. Well, <laughs> they don't. So we and needed actually, to like have an um Because people have gotten really... Yeah, uneducated. No, it's and, and, well. I, I, yes, I, I sort of agree, but I also or sort of say educated. Yeah, it's just different focus. There's right. so much new information; it's mm -hmm. very hard, and you can just find the old information by clicking a button these days. Um, but we went through a number of changes, and then after the election happened in 2016, that kind of radically changed Act <laughs> Three. Because I mean, I mean, we all forget because we live in this sort of Orwellian world where you know old news just becomes erased and changed, but. Um, for most of, you know, coastal types, um, that was a complete shock, and it totally changed people's outlook, and mm -hmm. we, we felt we had to address that. So that was a late change post-workshop. Um, After the New England Conservatory workshop, we had a whole new Act 3. Um, so it was kind of, kind of an interesting twist. So what, Cerise, what were those changes you brought in for Act 3 at that point? Um, well, uh, I, I think at that point we... Um... <laughs> we we were truly now examining the what <laughs> to make America great slow, uh -huh. you know. Right. And so at that point in time, um, um, I think it dovetailed really nicely with the idea of paradise, a utopia, or at least the aspiration to that, and the fact that in order to maintain that. Uh, the means um, maybe when, when, were not good. Mm -hmm. And we examined that. So that is the anti-intellectualism of a book, a good old-fashioned book burning. Yes. Don't have many of those nowadays. But, you know, it's a metaphor for, for what, what was happening, what is still happening mm -hmm. in terms of anti-intellectualism, suspicion, of um, anything that requires um, more than a three-word phrase, and um, and the question of good and evil, what those, who the, what that means, and who those are, and how how that twists, and how, you know, um, what what is that line from Into the Woods? Nice isn't necessarily good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so exactly. I, I realize, <laughs> yeah, I realize we probably should go back just a minute and just. Can you give me the very brief synopsis for the listeners what this story is about and who's in it? Oh, my God. Julian, you're going to have to do this. All right, well, you're, you're the writer, Cerise. <laughs> I'm so in the weeds for it because it's so hard to... Okay, I can, I can do a, a quick version. So, basically, yes. the opera opens with um, Revelation Has Occurred. It is the time after time. Yes. Um, and all the sort of dark characters are down there. And they're trying to figure out 
um, how to really restart this whole idea of humanity again, and and the idea that um, for humans to be humans, they need to have both good and evil. Uh -huh. That what's going on up there is this sort of opaque, um, almost totalitarian state. So Lucifer and Hades, who come from different mythological traditions, are band together with three Furies, who also kind of are a different world. Right. And they all sort of create this team um, where they're trying to destroy eternal light. And they're doing that through trying, in a terrorist kind of way, like blow up the power plant. Um, and then they um, enlist Persephone, and that in introduces the love story between Persephone and Hades, or a love-hate story. And then... Um, finally, they, they bring uh, Sumse in, who is the author of The Art of War, and he comes up with an incredible strategy, and Act One kind of ends up with him putting his strategy forward with what we need to do is reintroduce art, literature, opera, mm -hmm. pop music, all this sort of stuff. And then, but it's all completely frenetic and kind of crazy. And I always like to say that it's like um, that old movie, uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? It's like <laughs> Toontown of mythological characters where they're all bouncing into each other and not quite understanding each other's references, etc. So then Act 2 opens with an interlude that steals um, the interlude from Gluck's Orphée verbatim with sort of music <laughs> concrete added in. And that is their pathway in the opposite direction right. up to up there. Um, right, because Persephone can go between worlds. She can go between the worlds, so she, um, she's the one who's guiding them up there. Mm -hmm. and, and then they meet Adam and Eve, who are at this point sort of just prototypes mm -hmm. <laughs> of man and woman. And they start to infect them with this knowledge. And then they, they suddenly wake up. There's this uh, long, beautiful aria called Blood Rubies, where Persephone... Um, and it's the first time that there's an old-fashioned classical opera aria. Because uh -huh. the whole first part is like Johnny Skeeky or False Step. Move, 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 move. Okay. Okay. So they are in the middle of corrupting Adam and Eve when the Archangel Michael shows up as this kind of crazy male soprano with bleach blonde hair. Um, <laughs> and, and he uh, basically puts a stop to everything. He kidnaps um, Adam and Eve. And that's sort of how... Um, and there's, there, there's some philosophical stuff between he and Lucifer. Uh, All right. And then Act 3 is... Uh, yes, they Let's, go, let's yeah. leave that alone. Go, go, go. Okay. They can figure that when they come to see the opera. So you work together and you got the get going, got the production up in 2017 up in Boston. Yep. And then how much has it been changed, revised since then, since 2017 to the new production? Has it changed any series? Yes. Absolutely, you know, um, opera, um, unlike theater, does not have a preview period, so <laughs> in a strange kind of way, the world premiere is almost at functions as a preview. Right, the only person who's getting lucky about that right now is Ricky Ian Gordon and Lynn Nottage. Exactly. Because Intimate Apparel is getting a 10-week run. Yeah. No, and I actually did the workshop of that, and Bart was like, you guys in opera, it's crazy, you don't get any, you, know, you don't get any previews, we get all these previews, a month. I mean, you, you get some workshops, now at least, you know, they brought the workshop system into opera, which helps to a point, and you're doing libretto readings, yeah. but even then, it, it, once it gets on stage, that's another animal, so go on with your, sorry. Exactly, and so... of the opera um, was not as effective as it could be because, of course, we had many iterations of it. We had several workshops, and in each workshop, we would try a different mm -hmm. something, ending, middle, whatever it is, and we decided to go back to the concept of one of the workshops, and, of course, Julian is fabulous because many composers will say, oh, my God, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> no, I still, yeah, Cerise, yeah, I don't know if you... <laughs> Yeah. Cerise, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but I still have to write three minutes of music. <laughs> oh my god! They need a co they need a costume change. So two weeks ago, they said, "Can you do three more minutes of music?" And that's a lot of work. You know, it's I understand this being a composer, uh, dramaturg. That I had one piece that went through three different versions. From the version where we had a cast of eight, the version where everyone said, well, you have to have un understudies, so we threw in an ensemble, right. <laughs> so they would have understudies. Then we started writing for the ensemble, and we threw almost all of that out and came back to the cast of eight and went to an intermissionalist uh, hour 45 show. It, it, but it took putting it on its feet to figure that out, and it, it is the process, indeed. Yes, it is. 
So we had another workshop this fall with the Manhattan School of Music that was really lovely. They were so helpful, mm -hmm. and we tightened it considerably. And there were those who were at both the Boston premiere and at that workshop who came up to me afterwards and said, oh, this, this is much tighter. I mean, it was kind of amazing. It's two years apart that they would remember mm -hmm. that there's a sort of tighter feeling to it. So that's good. Well, I'm, I can't wait to see this. So when I ask, what's next for you, Cerise? And then I'll ask Julian. Uh, well, I have a um, small activist opera company. and uh, Yes, that's White Snake Productions, correct? Yes, White Snake Projects, yes. White Snake Projects. And um, we do one original opera a year. By original, I mean, you know, with original stories. Yes. And uh, so next year, we're doing... Um, another original opera called Cosmic Cowboy. As a matter of fact, Julian referred the composer of that piece to me. Her <laughs> name is Lena Rua. And we're all, you know, this is a very um, collegial group of people we have um, <laughs> it's around true. the table. So that's what's happening next for me. That's what I'm working on. And you have, along with that, you have uh, Singing Out Loud, the project oh, that okay. goes... That I'm, is Sing Out Strong. Sing Out Strong, and, yes. Yes, and it's a it's a fabulous commissioning uh, uh, series where we commission 10 composers and 10 writers who are not professionals. They could be electricians or cooks mm -hmm. or housewives or whatever to write about um, um, their stories. Because the key here is to amplify uh, voices that are not normally heard. So uh, our in in all, and then I match the composers and writers and we make three minute songs. Mm -hmm. And then we tour Boston with those songs and end up on the main stage. But essentially last year it was Sing Out Strong Immigrant Voices. So we had a lot of immigrant stories. Mm -hmm. And next year it's going to be Sing Out Strong Decolonized Voices. So we'll have a lot of stories about people experience of colonization. Well, that is very wow. trenchant now. That's that's for sure. Yeah. I mean, especially, uh, I mean, what's happening, I mean, if we look at Puerto Rico and how it's being treated, that it's being treated as, you know, not a part of America. And, exactly. And, and other, uh, other countries with their colonies. It's just, and what, what happens when big countries come in and colonize? I mean... The history of uh, of Lund of England is not particularly great with this, or France, or, or France, ones. yes, <laughs> or, or, or. yes. And so, as part of this activist opera, we be showcasing these voices, and I've also just launched um, uh, an alternative. And you'll be interested in this, an alternative to the normal Chris uh, Christmas fair with you know Christmas carols, right. And, so and so forth. I mean, I love all of that stuff, but I feel like it's not reflective of the diversity that is American society today. So it's called Let's Celebrate Alternative Living uh, Traditions in America. And what it is, is um, I want to do three 20 minute operas, which tell stories about alternative holiday celebrations in America. Mm -hmm. Run those together as a full evening around the holiday season. So about, you know, now. And uh, you could write about the Spring Festival. You can write about Diwali. You can write about Kwanzaa. You can write about any alternative holidays that, mm -hmm. that uh, people know about but really don't know very much about. Well, that that's exciting. I, it's I belong to Unity Church of New York for a long time, and they celebrate all the holidays, uh, which is really exciting. And they make a point of explaining them, uh, and that was that was it was very inclusive and very helpful. Um, being Jewish and being there because you felt okay because everyone was accepted and everyone. Well, was, yeah, that's that's the plan. Yes. yes. So, and Julian, what is next? Um, oh boy, lots of uh, conducting things, mm -hmm. lots of uh, a few composition projects. I have another opera that um, Prototype Beth Morrison Projects has commissioned um, with Royce Vaverick, and that's Ooh. for 2023. <laughs> 
Um, the ever present. The ever voice, present. Voice yes. back, right? Exactly. Um, and we already we just did a piece together last year um, called Epistle Mass that went really well, so we're happy about that. Then I have a couple of other choral orchestral things, and. Um, just, and you're busy enough, I mean, just with Trinity Wall Street. Yeah, Trinity keeps me very busy. We're now in the uh, the new big building again, and it was down for 18 months, and we mm-hmm. have our whole Bach at One series, and all of our commissioning, etc. So it's a very, very exciting time, and, and all the guest conducting. And I was just out in Kansas and Cleveland, I'm going to Grand Rapids, I was in and, Beijing. And you and also have, I mean, a, a longer history with Prototype, Yeah. because I, I know uh, the Wall Street, Trinity Wall Street Choir has been part of a lot of those yeah. pieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we were part of Breaking the Waves, Prism, um, Angel's Bone, Bone. Um, oh, what else? It's like four or five, Winter's Child, so it's been, yeah. Oh, and Aquanetta. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah. my God. Those women in Aquanetta were so strong. Yeah. It was such a wild, wonderful, yeah, yeah, yeah. woolly piece. Yeah, yeah. So um, I want to wish you both luck with the opening um, and with this new version of the opera. And Happy New Year. And I'm going to do my closer. So wishing our listeners an exciting New Year of opera going. And if you aren't yet, please consider becoming a subscriber. Thank you for joining me, Julian, and Cerise. This has been Chuck Sachs for Indie Opera Podcast.